Again, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very pleased to have you here for our workshop for waterfront homeowners, um, helping you manage your marine shoreline um, for your property and your legacy. Who's putting on this workshop is, is a good place to start. So Pierce Conservation District today is hosting this workshop. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the district, we are a governmental organization. We're a non-regulatory special purpose district. So we don't have any enforcement or permitting authority. Our purpose is really to equip landowners like yourselves with resources and opportunities to steward your own lands um, in a way that benefits your property, but also benefits our shared natural resources in Pierce County. And the district's been around since 1949. So we have a long history of working with landowners and land managers in Pierce County. And at the district, we do work on a wide variety of different types of lands um, and with lots of different types of people. Um, we have our four main programs, which are habitat improvement, farm planning and agricultural assistance, water quality, and urban agriculture. Um, and many folks in, in Pierce County know us for our annual native plant sale, uh, which offers restoration grade native plants at wholesale prices to the general public each fall, coming up soon this November. Um, but we just work with the community in a lot of different ways um, throughout Pierce County. But today, we're really focused on landowners on our marine shorelines. And um, we're able to do that under the umbrella of the Shore Friendly Program, which is actually a regional program with um, kind of local branches, local chapters all over uh, the Puget Sound region. And Shore Friendly links waterfront residents like yourselves to that technical support um, and resources in order to make informed, cost-effective, and environmentally friendly decisions about shoreline management. Um, and we'll talk at the end, like I said, about the specific um, services that we provide, but our goal is really to help you manage your land with confidence so that generations to come will enjoy it as much as you do. And finally, who are the people in the room? So my name is Mary Krauser. I am the Shore Friendly Pierce Lead at Pierce Conservation District. I'm also the Shorelines Program Manager there. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Ryan Bird, on the line today as our, our tech host, um, but he's also our Habitat Restoration Manager um, with more of a focus on uh, freshwater and riparian zones. And finally, we are very pleased to be joined today by Andrea McLennan from Herrera Environmental Consul Consultants. Excuse me. Andrea has over two decades of experience as a coastal geomorphologist and project manager in the Puget Sound region. She has worked on projects ranging from sound-wide coastal mapping and geomorphic assessments to sea level rise and vulnerability adaptation reports. Um, Andrea has co-authored regional guidance documents on <clears throat> excuse me, bluff and beach management, uh, and, or excuse me, bluff and beach processes, coastal erosion management, and climate change adaptation. So we're very pleased to have her here to provide the bulk of our presentation today and really give us that context um, for land management decisions on the shoreline. And I know she'll give a little bit more of an introduction of herself before she uh, dives in on her presentation too. Well, hello. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us here this morning to talk about coastal processes in Puget Sound. I'm Andrea McLennan. I um, will advance the slide here, my introductory slide. Um, I'm a coastal geomorphologist. I've been working as a consultant in the Puget Sound region for over 20 years now. Um, I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest. I'm actually was was born and raised in BC, but also grew up in the Seattle area. And so I've you know spent spent most of my life sailing and kayaking throughout um, throughout these waters, and obviously fell in love with them so much that I chose to study uh, our shorelines um, in university. 
Um, I actually have family that are, that are in the, that are in the field of coastal geomorphology, which is um, how I ended up stumbling a across this um, very unique and uh, polysyllabic field. <laughs> Um, so as, as uh, Mary mentioned, I um, have been involved with the development of several different data sets and guidance documents and other studies on Puget Sound shoreline processes, um, including like measuring long-term bluff erosion rates. So I have lots of experience, hands-on kind of understanding um, our, our coastal processes. I've also um, mapped the Pierce County shoreline by boat twice, and uh, what, a, what a treat that was um, to actually get paid to look at all of these beautiful shoreline environments. So I'm very familiar with the shores of Pierce County. I've spent a lot of time there, and uh, definitely uh, appreciate these lovely shorelines upon which you live. I've also been involved with the Pierce County SMP update, so I'm familiar with some of the regulatory environment as well as lots of the other regional efforts to uh, restore the Puget Sound that have been led by, uh, you know, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's actually a federally funded restoration program to kind of help reverse the decline of Puget Sound. And there are a lot of great guidance um, materials developed as part of that work. And I'm going to kind of refer to them a little bit later in the presentation. But I'm also um, really enthusiastic to be about the Shore Friendly Program, which um, is, is this outreach work um, specifically for shoreline property owners in the Puget Sound. About 55% of the Puget Sound shoreline is in private residential ownership. So you guys are um, important stakeholders in, um, in this overall effort to better the Puget Sound region and really um, in actively managing um, our shorelines. Okay, so just here's a brief overview of what I'm going to cover in my presentation. Clearly trying to cover a lot. Um, we're kind of going to skim the surface and then I'm going to provide you with a lot of, um, or with some additional references if you want to read up on it later. So we're going to start with just kind of a brief review of some of the terminology that I'm going to be using and that are commonly used on our beaches and in the near shore, as we as we refer to it. Um, then I'm going to talk more about the, the physical processes at work um, in the Puget Sound shoreline environments. I'm going to talk about the, the different uh, geomorphic shore types, so the different the different types of shoreline environments that we see in the region and the and and how they're different, how they behave differently, and we're going to talk about um, shoreline armor and the impacts of the armor on those processes, and um, then I'm going to provide you with some additional information on sea level rise and management considerations that could be helpful for you as property owners. Okay, so we're going to start off with uh, looking more closely at this word, coastal geomorphology. Now, every time I introduce myself to someone and they may ask what I do for a living, I, I have to kind of um, unpack this very um, clunky word of coastal geomorphology. Now, um, you know, technically the definition is that coastal geomorphology deals with the evolution of coastal landforms, the processes at work on them, and the changes that are taking place. Now, this definition comes from Eric Bird, which is what he's one of the grandfathers of the field um, in Australia. It's a very international field of study uh, throughout, um, I guess, other countries. It's commonly within the field of physical uh, physical geography. Um, however, in um, in the states, it's within the field of geology. Now, I have an interdisciplinary background um, in both the geology and the ecology, and one of the things that I like to do is really pair the two together, and that happens to work really well with how we're approaching restoration in the Puget Sound region. So, um, the um, all ecosystems are consist of a number of different components and shore form types. And within each of these different um, components, there are different processes at work. 
and different habitats that are found in there. Um, and those habitats are obviously um, important homes for different species that we have living in these different environments. So within the Puget Sound region, we have many different types of shoreline environments. In fact, almost all of the different types of shorelines that are found across the world are found within the Puget Sound region, you know, ex excluding those that are specific to the, the tropics. And um, each of those different shoreline environments are, are linked with different types of processes, habitats, and then critters. So whether it's bluffs or rivers and streams or barrier beaches, which is this low elevation shoreline here um, that you see that you see on the right. Um, they consist of a number of different habitat types like um, the the upper beach or the mud flat, the um, the beach that's subjected to waves versus kind of a more protected embayment here. Um, and then, of course, um, humans that are using the landscape as well. Now, for all of the the critters or uh, these these important species to to thrive and survive, from orcas to salmon, as you can see here in this image, with um, with all of these different kind of iconic species that are seen in the Puget Sound. The, the processes that are supporting those habitats need to be functional and be able to support those habitats. So as the processes maintain the habitats that support the critters in their various life stages, um, we, um, we, we kind of need to make sure that they're all working together and sustaining them. So one of the most um, important examples of these connections is that between the erosion of our coastal bluffs and the delivery of sediment to the beaches that are actually important spawning habitat for forage fish or also referred to as bait fish. So these fish include um, uh, herring, which spawn in our eelgrass beds, uh, which are found in the lower intertidal. And, um, and then surf smelt and sand lands, which actually spawn in the upper beach sediment. Now these forage fish make up the whole central part of the marine food web, and they are foraged upon by everything from shorebirds to salmon and, and to orcas. Now, um, I have referenced here this, uh, this beaches and bluffs um, document where you can read a little bit more about um, about a lot of the topics that I'm going to touch on today, and you can find this at PugetSoundNearshore.org. There's a tab for the technical documents, and that's where you'll find this, as well as uh, a, a number of other documents that go into greater detail on the great blue heron and orcas and salmon and forage fish, all of these different valued ecosystem components that we see here in um, the Puget Sound Nearshore ecosystems. Okay, so every as we move forward through this presentation, you're going to hear me refer to different parts of the beach. So I thought it would probably be helpful by um, by starting off with defining terms. Now, um, one I guess one one of the words that you're going to hear me use a lot is the term nearshore, which which technically extends from you know from from sea from the sea. Here, or the, the waterward extent is the, the maximum depth of the photic zone. Now the photic zone is the, is the um, depth to which light penetrates through the water column. So this is where you see a lot of the eelgrass growing, um, um, kelp beds, all the other um, kind of photosynthesizers that are, that are in the, um, growing in the water here. So, and then moving inland all the way to the upper extent of the salt spray. Uh, which is kind of a not very specific definition, but but it works. Um, so this is in the uplands here. These are you know just this, just your your coastal forested environment. And then now moving from from the upland waterward again, we have um, the upper limits of the salt tolerant vegetation or the dune vegetation. This is where you see dune grass growing and driftwood. This is the this is the back shore here. Um, 
this this area is is commonly really only wet during during storm events and when that that occur um, at at high water or at high tide and you have the the beach face which is one of the more active parts of the beach. This is the kind of the sloping part of the beach where the sediment is commonly moving around. It's a little hard to walk on. Um, you know, cobbles and gravels tend to roll around as you're walking along there. And um, then, then there are the sand flats where it's a much lower gradient and typically consisting of um, just sand and finer sediment. Um, they're also commonly um, sandbars um, that are that are migrating along the low tide terrace. That's where sediment is stored on the beach. Uh, moving on, there's another picture, kind of looking at the different terminology that you see here. Again, you see that the 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 end of the photic zone here is that that the deepest part of the near shore, and then extending all the way up, um, you know, to the landward extent of the salt spray, salt spray, pardon me, which again is, is going to be up in the bluffs, if this is a, a bluff shoreline. This is the crest of the bluff, that's the, the, the waterward edge where, you know, the, the bluff kind of, um, it becomes very steep and goes towards the beach. Commonly at the base of the bluff, you'll find landslide colluvium, that's a landslide material. Um, then um, you, you commonly have a, a little bit of a storm berm here, waterward of the toe of the bluff. This is the toe of the bluff. Um, these berms are created by storms. Uh, you often see driftwood deposited up here. Uh, right here's the, the berm crest that's, that marks the beginning of the beach face where you have this kind of uh, steeper gradient uh, going down towards the water. And then, um, and then that transitions to the low tide terrace, which is where you, where you have those broad sand flats that are much flatter and consisting largely of sand, like I mentioned before. So both the topography and the geology of the Puget Sound region have been um, heavily shaped by um, the glacial legacy or the uh, recent glaciations of um, the region. Now, um, there have been at least three major ice ages in the Puget Sound region, though the kind of the, the last one has really had the greatest influence on the modern shorelines that we see today. But the um, each of, within each of these different glaciations, the 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 um, Puget lobe, which you see here, of the Cordillerian ice sheet. This is this finger that extends down the the Puget lowland or Puget trough has um, advanced and receded multiple times. So across each ice age, it advances and recedes multiple times. Now over time, that led to um, the development of these north and south trending basins that make up the Puget Sound region. So we're talking about, you know, locally, you know, Car and Case Inlet and the Tacoma Narrows um, and uh, Hood Canal and, um, you know, the, the um, Saratoga Passage up in the northern Puget Sound. So with, any, with, with each of those advan advances, there was always um, subglacial meltwater. So kind of like a river of uh, water and sediment being carried, carried with the glacier that kind of helped with carving um, that landscape or carving those basin basins. Now, as the... Um, as the glaciers receded all of the and, and melted, the sea levels rose and without the weight of the glaciers over top of the land, the land uplifted. And um, this was about 5,000 years ago that sea level started to um, balance out around its current level and our current shorelines began to evolve. Now our beaches are most, they're, they're, the Puget Sound beaches are definitely um, unique across the region. Um, I mean, across the globe. Um, they're commonly uh, described as coastal bluffs that are fronted by narrow mixed sand and gravel beaches. And the, the narrow mixed sand and gravel beaches is, is part of the unique nature of our shorelines. Like um, in, in many places throughout the world, you, you see more homogenous um, 
coastal sediment, like either just sand or just a coarser sediment like gravel or cobble. Now, the, the, the geologic um, history of our coastal bluffs is one of the reasons that our beaches are so unique. Our bluffs and all of that material left behind from, the glacier, from those uh, most recent glaciations uh, supply about 90% of the sediment on our beaches. And um, this is very unique and um, across um, the world, in most cases, um, the, the uh, beach sediment is not coming directly from, our, from coastal bluffs or adjacent coastal bluffs. In most cases, um, uh, river or stream sediment is supplying um, sediment to the beach. Now, the type of sediment that you see on a beach um, is going to be dependent on the sediment that that bluff is made up of. So, it, and, it, and then it also depends on um, the amount of wave exposure that you see and the shore orientation, so the direction that that sediment is traveling. Now, when we talk about waves, you'll hear me use the term fetch because within the Puget Sound region, it's very kind of crenulated um, and uh, complex shoreline. Their waves are often limited in, in how large they can develop and they're referred to in the Puget Sound as fetch limited. That means that they, the, the waves, which are generated by winds can only get so large because the fetch is limited. So, Fetch is the uh, open water distance over which wind blows without interference from land. So in, in many cases in the Puget Sound region, they're just maybe a, a mile or two of fetch. So our waves can only get so large. And um, yeah, okay, so a little more on sediment transport. So waves sort beaches. So the waves, um, larger waves can carry um, much larger sediment that smaller waves cannot. And so we commonly see very little sediment transport um, occurring on our beaches, except for during big storms, when, when the, the waves have a much greater carrying capability or carrying, uh, carrying capacity. So when we see our waves kind of co-occur with, with high water events, and um, a storm surge, which is, you know, kind of elevated water levels from low pressure. We commonly refer to these times as change events because with, with all of that high water and with all of that um, wave action on the beach, we will see more change than we maybe have seen all year or across multiple years. So these are our big events where we see the most change during high water and during storms. Okay, now you see more change in some places than you do in others. And this is because wave energy is focused on the headlands. That's what this graphic is trying to show. No, I don't, are you guys? There we go. So the wave energy is focused on the headlands and then dissipates into the embayments. So you have much higher wave energy here where the wave energy is focused and then the wave energy kind of tapers out moving into an embayment. Hopefully you guys are able to see my cursor. Now over time, um, this ob oblique wave approach, it will produce an along shore current as the waves kind of, um, they, they wash up the beach at an angle and then the back swash flows perpendicular to shore. That's what generates the current. And um, this is, this. This is uh, the direction of the transport is directly related to the, the directions the waves are coming, right? So the direction of transport is going to be reliant on where the wind um, is coming from, which is generating those waves. So the direction of transport can shift periodically based on um, where the waves are coming from. Like there, are, there will com commonly be you know, here in the Puget Sound region, our uh, predominant and prevailing winds are from the south, but um, commonly during the 
Um, so I should take a step back. So pr uh, predominant is the strongest, prevailing is the most commonly occurring waves. But we also have winds from the north, particularly during the summertime. And um, so, so you may see um, a little bit of sediment transport in another direction during the summer, where over the course of the year, it'll generally be, um, it will uh, generally be associated with the southerly, southerly winds. Now, across the Puget Sound region, all of our shorelines have been delineated into distinct um, net shore drift cells in which there's a predominant direction of sediment transport. So you can kind of see from, from the, this graphic here on the left, you have consistent sediment transport to the north pushed by the, the predominant and the prevailing uh, waves coming from the south. So they're coming from the south and pushing the sediment northward along shore. Now there's about 900 different drift cells in the Puget Sound region. Um, they range in length from um, a few hundred yards to uh, a few miles. Um, all of them have their own sediment supply areas, um, neutral throughputs or transport zones and outputs or depositional areas, also referred to as sediment sinks. There's a lot of different terms for these different, these different things that are generally the same. The cell boundaries are rarely definite. They're, they're kind of generalized zones that are kind of depicted on these maps with uh, dotted lines. You can see here at a headland, um, the, the drift cell, there's two different drift cells. One, um, one moving to the northeast and another moving to the, uh, the northwest. And this area here between the drift cells is called a divergence zone where those two cells are diverging. And you may have sediment kind of moving in one direction or the other, um, just depending on, um, on the, the, the waves that occur on a given day. Areas that are outside drift cells are um, kind of nicknamed NAD shores, which stands for no appreciable drift. Now, areas with no appreciable drift are um, uh, mapped as such either because there's a lack of wave energy to transport sediments, or there's a lack of sediment to be transported. So our bedrock shores are mapped as NAD shores. And um, shores um, within very protected embayments like lagoons, those are also mapped as NAD shores. And then those, are, those other kind of random shorelines within marinas, for example, those are artificial shorelines that are, that are commonly mapped as NAD also. Now here you see a map of all of the different um, net shore drift cells in Pierce County. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our, our predominant winds and waves are coming from the south and that and that pushes and um, the sediment to move northward in most cases unless that sh shorelines are sheltered um, from those southerly waves and then you commonly occur uh, southward or you commonly see southward sediment transport. Now how you read this map is that the, the shorelines in this kind of red color exhibit um, drift from right to left, as shown in the legend here. Now, you read this, these maps like you're, you're standing directly offshore and looking at the shoreline. So from right to left here, and then from uh, left to right for um, all of the green shorelines. So you can see, you know, along here in Car Inlet, predominantly the, the direction of sediment transport is northward due to those waves. And um, it gets a little strange where the shorelines are sheltered from the south, but, but we're generally exhibiting that same, that same pattern um, of northward sediment transport where you're exposed to the southern, to the south. Okay, next, I just want to briefly talk about um, kind of what happens to our shorelines over thousands of years. 
So we're we're generally talking about what happens over the hundreds of years. Now we're 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 reaching out another um, order of magnitude to how these change over time. Now, generally, our coasts want to straighten over time as the wave energy is focused on headlands. <coughs> now, I love this graphic, but I know it can be a little bit counterintuitive to look at um, immediately. These pictures here on the right are looking at the beach in profile, whereas um, these images here, we're, we're taking more of a bird's eye view and looking down at the shoreline. So these are, these are two headlands with an embayment in the middle. You have that wave energy focused on the headland that causes them to erode more rapidly and that sediment to be transported into the embayments. So over time, that results in the straightening of the shoreline. You can see the embayment kind of filling up as the headlands kind of slowly recede landward. And over time, a little barrier or a spit might develop in front of the embayment. And eventually, the, the shoreline is, is more straightened. Now, generally, our shorelines are in more of an, an intermediate um, stage of development. They're, they're kind of teenagers. And we definitely have some spits, but generally, we only have a partially straightened shoreline. Moving on. OK, next, I'm going to talk about the different shoreline types. Now, you may hear me use uh, um, a number of different terms for the different shoreline types. So generally, these are coastal landform types, landform types that um, the folks in this field uh, will refer to both as shore types or shore forms. So shore form just kind of being, again, that nickname for a coastal landform. They have been mapped across the Puget Sound region do, using different uh, mapping approaches. And um, so, so some of the terminology gets a little bit mixed. And so in some cases, you'll hear me give a couple of different terms um, for the different shoreline types. They can be used interchangeably, but hopefully that's um, no source of confusion for you. And we can um, stop and answer questions at any point. Uh, typically, we organize different shoreline types by the dominant processes that are at work on them. So whether if they're, if they're dominated by waves or uh, tidal processes or fluvial um, processes in the case of where there are river or stream systems. So um, here's a kind of a nice picture showing all of the different shoreline types um, that we see in the Puget Sound region. Our artificial shores are those that are not really functioning like a, a natural shoreline anymore due to heavy shoreline modifications, typically consisting of heavily armored shores um, uh, combined with um, near shore fill. So the shoreline in these cases is usually in a totally different place than it was historically, and that's affected the sediment transport. Um, and a lot of these cases, there, these are like marina shores that have a breakwater that's totally changed the wave environment as well. Um, and then moving on to barrier beaches, these are low elevation shorelines that are depositional in nature. They have developed as a result of long term sediment deposition over hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, uh, they're commonly referred to as barrier beaches. Um, but they're also referred to as spits, and there are a number of different types of spits that we see. But um, you know, these these areas are the most vulnerable to flooding, um, and they're very dynamic. Um, next, we have our bluff back beaches. Now, there are several different types of of bluff shorelines that we see in our shoreline in in the Puget Sound region, and they've actually been split up into different bluff types based on the amount of sediment supply that they're delivering to our beaches. Now, our feeder bluffs are those that are contributing um, a lot of sediment to the near shore on a somewhat regular basis. Now, these shorelines often don't have, you know, they're, they're characterized by, by an absence of vegetation on the bluff face. In many cases, there are down trees at the base of the bluff. So they're actively kind of contributing driftwood into our into the system. 
and um, they'll have like an active landslide scarp, sometimes some landslide colluvium at the base. But generally, these are our sediment supply areas. Now, next, there are transport zones, which are our, our more stable bluffs. They're usually heavily vegetated with conifers. And, um, you know, these, these are bluffs that are not changing much. They often have a wider beach in front of them as well with, with considerable driftwood deposits. So these are, these are areas where there are those throughputs within the net shore drift system where um, the sediment is just kind of continuing to be transported. It's neither really actively eroding or, um, or uh, depositing. Next, we have these uh, different types of embayment shorelines, uh, both the barrier lagoons have, um, you know, um, a barrier beach in front of them. And the landward shoreline is really the barrier lagoon that um, consists of, a, you know, a salt marsh and very protected shoreline without any source of fresh water. Whereas a barrier estuary, just like it sounds, it has a little estuary in there, which is the mixing of the fresh water with the salt water. And these, um, both of these environments are really valuable habitats for out-migrating um, juvenile salmon, as well as um, juvenile forage fish. These are like our little uh, nursery habitats within our broader Puget Sound nursery for, um, for fish specifically salmon in the, um, in the Puget Sound region. So next we have our, um, we have pocket beaches, which are little beaches that are found between bedrock headlands. You see these most often in um, the San Juan Islands, as well as in, um, you know, there's some others in like Hood Canal and Jefferson County and, and Clallam County. So they, these, these pocket beaches are found with a, between, you know, either plunging rocky shores or rocky platforms. These are our bedrock shore types. And then we have our, the deltas, these large scale delta, you know, associated with our big river systems that are delivering sediment all the way down from uh, the Cascades or the Olympic Mountains. And so those are all of our different shoreline types. The Barrier beaches and our bluff beaches are um, are more dominated by waves, whereas these these lagoonal systems, these barrier estuaries, they're they're dominated by um, the the tidal flow in and out of a tidal channel, and these um, the uh, delta shores are are fluvially dominated. The um, these bedrock shores, the pocket beach. And the um, plunging rocky and rocky platform shores, those are also wave-dominated shoreline types. Okay, and this, this image just kind of depicts that, that sediment transport process coming from our coastal bluffs. You can see at this kind of like systems level, we have coastal erosion occurring from the bluffs uh, delivering sediment and that is then transported along shore. And what happens here where there's an armored shore, that sediment supply process is, is not able to occur. It's not really intact as the, um, the, the waves are not able to reach the toe of the bluff and generate that landslide um, or that, that bluff erosion. Now this, oh, unfortunately, this this um, map is not displaying very well, but it depicts the different um, shore forms that you see in um, in Pierce County. Now our feeder bluffs are shown in this bright blue color, and our transport zones, they're more neutral bluffs. Those are sh shown in this apple green, and those depositional shores. There's low elevation shores are shown in a bright yellow. So within each of the drift cells, you have active sediment supply areas. You'll have your, like here, we have our feeder bluffs at the, um, at the origin of the cell that are providing sediment that is transported along shore um, to the depositional environment here, like along the, the pretty spit. That is a great example 
of a, um, a barrier beach where we have the, the sediment supply beginning at the, at the drift cell uh, origin. Here you have our feeder bluffs um, transporting that sediment uh, northeastward um, and terminating at the end of the spit. Okay, now we're going to focus just on, on coastal bluff management. We'll talk more in depth about um, Puget Sound bluffs here. Now, bluff erosion um, in our region, but, but really, um, you know, more, more generally, results from a combination of numerous interacting processes. So you have both the the, the natural processes that work on the shoreline, and you have sea level rise and climate, and then you have other site-specific drivers, like what's really happening on that, on that property or in those uplands that are connected to the bluff itself. So all of our shorelines are, are caused by combination of interacting variables, either that marine-induced erosion, so that's the, the wave energy working at the, the base of the bluff, or subaerial erosion, which is erosion that is coming direct, uh, directly as a result of the, the geology of the bluff itself, and then human-induced erosion. So that's where it really comes down to how our uh, humans are, are using the uplands and, um, and how that is going to be affecting um, you know, the, the, the stability of the bluff. And we're going to talk about each of these different types of erosion in some greater depth. So marine-induced erosion is often not the sole trigger of, um, of a landslide or coast, coastal erosion on our coastal bluffs in Puget Sound. As I, we mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, our bluffs are, are fetch limited. So the wave energy is really insubstantial. It's, it can still ready a bluff for erosion, but oftentimes um, the uh, actual landslide will occur as a result of both um, subaerial erosion combined with that marine induced erosion. So the bluff may be over steepened as a result of um, wave energy um, eroding at the toe of the bluff, but it may be initiated um, by heavy precipitation. In fact, it's been well documented that um, heavy precipitation events are responsible for most of the landslides that occur in the Puget Sound region. And there's actually a documented precipitation threshold for when landslides occur in our region. Now that's all related to um, the, the, the geology of, um, of the bluffs themselves commonly um, due to there being permeable geologic, um, permeable geology overlying impermeable um, layers. So you can, you can see here in this, um, in this great picture, um, a good example of our shoreline geology. And you see like the, the Vashon till or the lodgement till is often seen as at the top of the bluff. It's the capstone unit. And um, it was kind of the last layer that was left behind. Um, beneath it, 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 excuse me, I should, I will give you a little bit more information on the Vashon till. It's pretty, um, it's pretty compacted in a matrix of coarse sand and um, it's pretty consolidated. It was underlying at least like a mile of ice at one point. And it's, it, it commonly consists of, you know, the pebbles and gravel in that coarse sand matrix. So not a lot of water is going through there, but it is actually permeable. So some water coming through the till and then beneath the till there's often advanced outwash sands. So these are less consolidated loose sandy materials that are very uh, permeable. So the water will sink seep straight through them and then you have uh, beneath it often a clay layer commonly referred to as the the Lawton clay that was left behind from a large glacial lake um, from, you know, during these glacial uh, processes, as the glaciers receded in some areas, water was trapped behind, uh, resulting in the development of this lake layer. Now, um, when the water kind of uh, 
percolates through these permeable layers and collects above the clay layer, it actually pushes the geology up and leading to the formation of a slide plane. Now these can be shallow landslides or deeper landslides. The main take home message here is that if you have, um, if you have clay that you can visibly see on your bluff, water management is going to be very important for uh, managing um, your erosion on your bluff. Now, next there's human-induced erosion. Now, human-induced erosion, as I said, is, is directly a result of like a, how um, humans are using the landscape. We have um, several different things that, that humans do that can exacerbate bluff erosion. Overloading the top of the bluff, um, doing substantial regrading and adding, adding fill to the top of the bluff. Um, can add additional weight to it, which increases those gravitational processes at work on the slope. Um, cutting into the toe of the slope or cutting off the toe of the slope, you know, to, to create a, a patio or a fill area that can also um, initiate landslides. Uh, grading and removing soil and dune vegetation removal, all pretty much vegetation removal, complete clearing, that definitely can initiate some landslides. Um, other additions of water, um, such as, um, you know, people leaving their irrigation systems on for uh, long periods of time, as well as like increased surface water run it, runoff from um, impermeable surfaces. Again, with vegetation removal, that leads to additional surface water runoff or lack of absorption or evapotranspiration. Uh, poorly designed drainage or failing drainage. You know, often we see uh, broken tight lines causing scouring on the bluff that will, will initiate a landslide. And um, in some cases, the septic tank leach lines can also be an initiator. But these, this graphic kind of depicts a lot of these different processes and, and how they kind of contribute to additional water and um, and then initiating slope failures. Now along all um, bluff, bluffs, coastal bluffs throughout the world, you, you see a, um, a general cycle of marine induced erosion. So um, this, this cycle here begins with waves eroding the toe of the bluff. Then the toe, um, you know, due to that bluff undercutting, is um, the bluff is destabilized, leading to shallow landslides. And as that landslide debris is deposited on the beach, it actually protects the toe of the bluff for a time, as waves will will chew away at that landslide colluvium rather than the toe of the bluff for as long as that material persists. So as it is slowly um, removed by the wave action and sediment transport, um, the, um, the, the wave erosion will, will again start to touch the beach and then eventually the bluff and the cycle repeats itself. Um, generally, there's seasonality to these cycles where more toe erosion is occurring during the winter storms when the toe of the bluff will be inundated during high water events. And, um, you know, that it will commonly occur during storms, so during our change events. And these, these big storms commonly come with heavy precipitation. So that's when we see a lot of our coastal landslides occur. And um, it's, uh, you know, for, for, for those people who are not living on the shoreline, it's, um, there's always usually at least like a, um, an alert as the Burlington Northern uh, Santa Fe Railway gets shut down from coastal landslides that one of our change events is in the process. Now our bluffs look different just based on the, the shoreline geology. And this is a result of um, you know, how compact the material is and um, what its angle of repose is. That's kind of like the, the um, 
the angle at which the, the bluff is kind of naturally stable. Um, here on the, the, the west shore of the west shore of Woodby Island, you know, you see our bluffs of outwash gravels that are kind of at a 30 degree angle, very characteristic of our, our outwash gravels. And then, um, you know, you have um, advanced outwash sands on our, our very high bluffs in the Tacoma Narrows, those 300 foot high bluffs. And we have much lower elevation bluffs consisting of till. Um, till, as I've mentioned before, is a very resilient um, unit and um, can hold like near a 90 degree angle of repose. You would think that this till was rapidly eroding, but it, it can actually be quite stable in that configuration for a number of years. And then in uh, this picture here on the on the bottom right is in northern Puget Sound, where there is more glacial marine drift um, along the shorelines, and um, it has a much um, greater uh, clay material or fines uh, that makes it more uh, vulnerable to water and. Uh, uh, that's why you see kind of this gullying or these little ravines all throughout there. Um, all throughout the, those bluffs. So they, they even look different based on that geology. Now, um, a couple of years ago, um, I headed up a study where we um, compiled and analyzed and, and measured a number of different bl long-term bluff erosion rates across the Puget Sound region. Now, some of these uh, bluff erosion rates were, were measured using historical uh, survey monuments and others were measured using historic air photos. Um, but what, what we did was we were, we were able to really evaluate this long term, these long term trends across the region and look at like what's really driving them. What are the most important drivers that we're seeing? And, um, you know, we were able to document that um, a geomorphic shore types were important as well as the fetch and the tidal range um, exhibited across the Puget Sound region. I'm not sure if many of you are aware that there is a major difference in tidal range across Puget Sound. There's a much smaller tidal range in um, the northern reaches of Puget Sound, um, you know, like in the San Juan Islands and Clallam County and, you know, right at, right at, at the entrance to Puget Sound, whereas all the way down in South Sound, there's a huge tidal range. So a difference between um, eight foot tidal range and 21 to 23 feet in tidal range. So that makes our shorelines look quite different. And for those folks in northern Puget Sound, it means that all of that wave energy is focused on a much narrower band, um, resulting in greater erosion rates. So the South Sound is actually in a great position because that wave energy is distributed across a much broader um, section of uh, the shoreline, or at least that, that profile, and um, that results in, in slower erosion rates. The shorelines within South Sound are also very sheltered from wave energy as compared to the northern reaches, so that also um, contributes to the slower erosion rates that we see on the bluffs in South Sound. And generally what we documented was um, the long-term um, average erosion rate of um, about a quarter of a foot per year. Well, that's annualized and, um, you know, across 10 or 15 years, that's, that's not a lot of erosion. And um, so we try and remind people that, that, that the erosion commonly occurs episodically. And you'll see, you know, following one of these big change events, you may see five or two to five feet of erosion in a single year. Now, that doesn't mean that your erosion rate is two feet per year. It may be that every five to 10 years, you're losing a few feet of bluff. So it's important for those people, particularly that are new to living on a bluff shoreline, that there, there will be bad years and there will be good years. <laughs> um, I should also mention that this, um, these, these erosion rates do not include anywhere where there was a deep seated landslide. 
there are a number of large deep seated landslides that just kind of function differently based on um, the kind of the um, the engineering geology of uh, the individual slope and what is really driving the landslide at that location. So um, you can see here these different erosion rates that we documented within Pierce County. Those with the most rapid erosion rates are shown in kind of this darker, um, darker red, whereas the slower erosion rates are, are those kind of in the, the lighter white and apricot colors. So you can, you can see just from this graphic that all of those areas with the highest erosion rates um, have quite a bit of fetch to the south. So they're more subjected to um, wave-induced erosion um, from those southerlies. Okay, just a, a brief summary of what we've talked about, um, about the, our coastal, uh, coastal bluff processes. Generally, the, our waves shape our coasts, and those waves are um, heavily influenced by our local winds. Um, bluff recession uh, typically occurs through shallow landslides with and ha exhibits re relatively low bluff recession rates, particularly in South Sound. The bluff erosion is important as it provides about 90% of the sediment found on our beaches. And our coasts are continually evolving through this process of, of uh, bluff erosion, um, sediment transport, and then deposition to our, our um, low-lying barrier beaches. The uh, net shore drift or the sediment transport processes form and maintain our beaches and the nearshore habitats that are found within it, uh, particularly the forage fish spawning habitats. And um, our, our net shore drift cells are really important for understanding the health of the sediment supply system and um, are very valuable for management for that reason. So moving on, next we're going to talk about the impacts of shoreline armor. So we've learned all about these processes that work on the shoreline. And yes, we're going to start with, with just, yeah, what is shoreline armor? Well, shoreline armor can look pretty different on different shoreline types. In general, shoreline armor can be made of numerous different types of materials. Um, but you know, whether it's, it's armor um, consisting of, of rock or riprap um, or um, concrete slabs. Um, generally, it's, object, it's, it's put in that place to, or it's put on the beach to slow down or prevent marine-induced erosion. Now, it can be placed in different parts of the beach. And all of these shoreline environments look different. This is, this is definitely an older armor structure that is associated with fill as well. And this is kind of more of your, your classic armored bluff, with the armor at the toe of the bluff designed to slow that, um, that, that wave-induced erosion. Now, um, shoreline armor has been mapped along about 33% of the bluffs in the Puget Sound. Now that is, you know, cumulatively results in, in quite an impact to the sediment supply um, along our different beaches. And um, how that can um, result is with narrowing of um, the beach, so kind of loss of the upper beach and um, impacts to those forage fish spawning areas that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. Now, um, you often hear a lot um, from the, the, the armor industry about, um, and the real estate industry actually, about um, how, how great it is to have armored shore, but the, it can actually be very difficult both to permit and to maintain over time. Um, in many cases with the armor um, just, 
just um, curbing the wave-induced erosion. It doesn't necessarily curb the other sources of erosion that are driving um, the bluff recession on your property, and it may get overtopped or destroyed from uh, bluff erosion. Um, it can also get uh, uh, overtopped or destroyed from waves. And um, so we we like to remind people that um, the armored um, an armored shore is, and it doesn't have all the answers. In fact, and then it actually doesn't manage all problems related to coastal erosion. So it's it's not it's not the end all be all solution that some people can make it out to be. So some of the impacts of shore armor is a you know direct burial of the beach. With that comes kind of a, a lack of um, storm berm or backshore area. So you kind of lose that, that valuable part of the beach that is so nice for recreating on and also provides an important function of absorbing, absorbing excuse me, wave energy uh, during storm events. So when, when the water is highest, on the beach, and um, and you have that you have an added elevation of a storm berm that um, I um, I pointed out in that early graphic of different parts of the beach. That is that that storm berm has been uh, designed by nature to absorb wave energy before it hits the toe of the bluff. So when you put a structure there, you actually um, lose that that natural function. In many cases, um, the wave energy, when, particularly when it's a vertical structure, like a concrete wall, will reflect the wave energy. So instead of that wave energy being absorbed by the storm berm that typically consists of you know, gravel that the water will percolate through and kind of absorb that wave energy, it will reflect off of a, a vertical structure or any other structure. It can even cause a scour trough waterward of it and 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 accelerate sediment being transported off the beach. So um, that um, that scour can result in a loss of fine sediments, um, mainly like the sands from your beach and a coarsening of the beach and even the lowering of the beach over decades. Um, wave erosion, um, the end effects um, that I just mentioned earlier kind of often occur, particularly where armor is infringing lower on the beach. Wave energy kind of diffracts around this hard corner and scours away at the adjacent back, at bank. In addition to those impacts, it can also affect the sediment transport, both in the loss of sediment input from the eroding bluffs, as well as um, the um, sediment being transported along shore can, can change as a result of extensive lengths of, of shoreline armor. It can both accelerate sediment transport in some areas and uh, impede it in others. We'll see that in the next slide. So the, um, the cumulative effects of miles of shoreline armor is something that, that scientists in Puget Sound are really still trying to get their heads around. Um, the decline of Puget Sound, the Puget Sound ecosystem as a whole has been characterized as death by a thousand cuts um, as a result of kind of all of these different impacts, all of these different little impacts kind of culminating into, you know, larger decline of the, the health of the system. So in many cases, you know, when people are concerned about end effects, rightly so, they're driven to get armor themselves. And then we end up with even more armored shore, which is kind of sending us in the wrong direction, particularly um, when it, um, when we start to look at evaluating the sediment supply across a whole uh, drift cell, where the sediment supply may be in decline, and then without, uh, due to shoreline armor, and then without sediment supply, the beaches continue to erode or will actually um, erode more rapidly because that, that, that sediment input is just not being replaced. The transport is continuing to occur, um, but the, um, the input 
is no longer occurring. So you have a net loss. And again, you'll see more beach narrowing and uh, coarsening as a result of that larger scale decline in sediment input. And that results in kind of simplified and lost habitats over time. So those forage fish spawning areas will be um, get buried by shoreline armor as well as um, impacted by the loss of the sediment supply and the fine sediment being transported away. In addition, our kind of complex crenulated shoreline gets um, uh, straightened and simplified. And in one of the big Puget Sound wide studies um, that I was involved with uh, to inform the larger restoration effort. It, we really documented the amount of shoreline length that has been lost just a result of, of the simplification and straightening of the shoreline. And um, so at, at a regional level, these, these impacts um, are large, even though, you know, incrementally they do seem small. So another potential um, impact of shoreline armor is um, the interruption of sediment transport along shore. And this happens on shores where you have like really substantially infringing armor. So where there's a lot of fill associated with the armor, um, which you can see on a lot of residential shores, but you see it in a lot of other really old shorelines. Uh, I mean, shoreline armor pardon me, I said that wrong, uh, along a lot of other um, um, shorelines that have been developed for a long time that are kind of grandfathered structures. They were structures that were permitted, you know, prior to the 1970s that, um, you know, such as such as along um, this restaurant right here, this is this is in Birch Bay, where, um, you know, this structure was permitted sometime prior to the 70s. And it really, it traps sediment from moving along shore. Now these, these groins, these are cross shore structures are also designed to trap sediment. They are not illegal anymore, but there are some still remaining on the shoreline and they create problems as well as they, they are effective in trapping sediment, sediment transport and, um, they, um, you know, impact the shorelines uh, similarly by causing downdrift erosion. Now, um, in a lot of cases, uh, as I mentioned before, bulkheads do fail over time, um, both directly from um, during storm events. Um, the drift logs can be a source of significant damage. Uh, one of the co another common um, reason for failure is uh, groundwater or waves overtopping. So just kind of the hydrostatic pressure that behind the structure leading to its uh, toppling and failure. Uh, loss of backfill is another reason that they commonly fail. Uh, flanking erosion, um, they can be undermined. Um, over time, commonly as the as the beach lowers, as a common side effect of the armor, they can undermine the foundation of the um, of the structure itself, leading it to topple. In many cases, they just gradually decay and disintegrate and get cracks in them, and then uh, begin to fail. And um, in other cases, they're just kind of inappropriately placed for the site conditions and uh, will fail as a result of landslides and um, or um, overtopping. So they're not always the solution they're proposed as, af uh, particularly after many years and um, changing conditions. Our, our shorelines are continually migrating and having a um, armor in a static position doesn't always work, um, work well in the long term. Okay, moving on to vegetation management. So um, vegetation along our shorelines is referred to as riparian vegetation. Along our marine shorelines, it's 
referred to as uh, marine riparian vegetation. So it's a very, bit of a mouthful, but um, it's Im Im important to know the these terms because they do get thrown around and, and, and there's a lot of importance to them. Like all of these different functions that marine riparian vegetations provide have been pretty well documented by the science community. And um, they're doing, a the vegetation is doing a lot for your shoreline, as well as for all of the critters and the habitats that are found on the shoreline. So this, this area here from, from the bluff crest between your home all the way down to the base of the bluff is called a marine riparian buffer. And within that buffer, there's a lot of different ecological functions at work. You have both um, um, benefits of, of water quality, um, the um, pollution abatement, say just, just having a, a, a marine riparian buffer between a road and the shoreline can um, provide a lot of benefits for just cleaning the water, um, as well as like removing um, fine sediment from the water, um, as well as like other contaminants such as, you know, different fertilizers or um, other um, particles coming from our cars. Um, they, the, um, the absorption by the vegetation um, provides an additional function for, you know, kind of curbing curbing shallow water landslides, uh, or excuse me, shallow water, shallow uh, landslides along our bluffs and um, other, other um, erosion resulting from surface water. So that could be like gullying or scouring of the bluff that could ready um, a bluff shoreline for landslides. Uh, the shade provided by the trees um, is valuable both for, for keeping, um, keeping the beach cool for, um, for those, uh, for that forage fish spawn, as well as contributing um, organic material and um, bugs that um, out-migrating juvenile salmon will be um, foraging upon. So all of these different functions together provide quite a bit. And the added structure that the roots provide to your shoreline, as well as absorption of water, also help to stabilize the bank. So there's an additional element of um, human health and safety. So there's a lot of different reasons to, to keep your shoreline vegetation, to keep your trees. And I think this picture um, kind of depicts uh, what, what we don't really see um, when we think of um, the values of our, our bluff vegetation, this network, this incredible network of roots provides a lot of strength to um, your bluff. And so in so many cases, when new developments are put in, they completely clear an area, we, we end up losing um, the strength that these roots are providing. So the more vegetation that you can maintain, the more resilient your coastal bluff will be to, to erosion. You really want this, this dense network of roots working for you and our, our coastal forests really developed in this way. So, so taking all of that um, vegetation away um, does make it more vulnerable to erosion. So there, there are many, uh, many reasons to maintain your, your vegetation, particularly at the crest of the bluff, it helps resist slides. And um, where there are slides, it minimizes the extent of those slides, reduces sheet flow, um, kind of absorbs different, uh, you know, absorbs the, the surface water, as I mentioned before. And in many cases, you can, um, you know, the, a, a dug fir, a cedar, or a madrone can, um, can even when it, it, the bluff appears undermined, it can still maintain, um, or it can still be maintained there for many years before it actually slides. And when it does slide, it is valuable for for the intact root wad to come down with it as it helps to slow that cycle of marine induced erosion. So when that, when a large tree um, is eroded from the bank, 
And yes, it does come with that sediment, but that sediment and that root wad may be trapped on the beach for a decade or more and actually protect the bluff for many years to come. So again, just like a brief summary, the, um, the benefits of vegetation includes, uh, include decreased surface water runoff, decreased ground saturation, fewer landslides, and um, fewer landslide hazards, which obviously comes with an expense. Um, it also increases evapotranspiration, increases slope stability, um, increases the water quality, um, you know, flowing out onto the beach as well as increases the amount of organic matter and large woody debris input on, um, into the near shore, which all have other um, ecological values. Uh, vegetation can also be used directly for slope stability. Um, you know, this is, this is particularly valuable in areas that are covered heavily with non-native invasive species and there's erosion present. Um, you know, here you see in this image, uh, a field of morning glory, it's so difficult to get rid of, um, but um, same, same goes with ivy. It can provide a lot of valuable um, function to remove it and, and, and replace it with native species. And there are contractors that can help you do this. Um, you can see here, they removed that, the, um, the invasive species and mulched and planted and, um, and, and have a, a much more vegetated and resilient uh, bluff today. Now, commonly this, this process occurs, you know, in, in several phases, beginning with the, you know, gentle removal of, um, of the armor and then covering with, with uh, erosion control blankets to not exacerbate you know, the soil erosion during this process. Um, in some cases, it's often like reinforced with a turf and jute mat, um, particularly after planting and then covered with, with mulch to um, kind of help all those species um, survive. The mulch helps to maintain moisture um, and kind of, kind of protect the, the um, the the new plantings from from getting too dry or too cold in the winter months and um, also helps to curb weeds coming back right away um, and yeah next i'm just going to briefly touch on drainage management you know, drainage is, is really important, obviously, from that early slide where I showed you all the different ways that humans can um, contribute to our erosion. It, it largely consisted of different examples of poor drainage. So, you know, ideally, we you want to see, um, uh, you know, the vegetation um, on the on the shoreline um, or, or in the uplands, helping to mitigate the surface water flow on your shoreline. Um, but in many cases, you know, there's there are, you know, conditions on a property that you've purchased that you may not be aware of. And getting to know your drainage system is is kind of an important step on in maintaining your shoreline property. There's a number of different ways that you can kind of recognize different problems at work here. There's, um, um, you know, too much irrigation kind of contributing to surface water flow, uh, broken tight lines, uh, runoff coming in from roads and other properties that can be problematic, um, poorly designed drainage, cracked or damaged pipes that could be contributing um, to erosion. Um, seepage from poor irrigation can 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 re reach all the way out on the bluff. This is this is that seepage occurring here on the bottom left from um, an irrigation system that's been left on. Um, that can result in pooling um, from uh, a neighbor's runoff or or your own poorly managed runoff. That that's another kind of sign of an issue. And then anywhere you see broken tight lines, that's, that's another kind of critical issue that, that needs to be addressed. 
Um, there are a number of different ways to mitigate these issues with uh, poor drainage. Um, you know, uh, collecting surface water runoff coming from your structures with uh, cisterns is a great example. Uh, minim minimizing your building footprints, using uh, gravel um, or other more permeable uh, surfaces rather than concrete. Um, having um, cisterns or, or other swales to to collect and um, treat runoff um, on your property can also be valuable. Maintaining native vegetation uh, between your home and the um, and the bluff crest is also critically important. And um, and then maintaining. Uh, overall maintaining drainage tight lines and having a tea dissipator at the bottom of the bluff is also very important um, for keeping the surface water off the bluff face, the bluff face, pardon me. Okay, here's just a, a, a summary of, of some of the, the, the bluff do's and don'ts. Um, when when siting um, a property or, or deciding where to put the home on the property, um, you want to locate the house and the septic field as far away from the bluff crest as possible. Um, ideally, if you're in this position, you would want to limit any clearing and disturbance to the greatest extent possible. Um, when um, when trying to improve your drainage, you also want to minimize any impervious surfaces where possible and um, control all the drainage, uh, particularly in, in really wet areas um, and, um, and definitely control the drainage in areas where the house is, is close to the bluff. Uh, retain all native vegetation where possible. Um, Use native soils and leave as large of a vegetation buffer as possible and um, never uh, weight the top of the bluff or cut off the toe. Those are, those are uh, important uh, bluff rules for everyone to play by. Um, so thank you so much um, for providing that um, kind of broader context that I think uh, we all need in order to um, address the challenges that we're, we're facing on our shorelines. Andrea, you brought us the perspective of, you know, what are those historical and geological um, processes that we are, are living with um, and have to make um, decisions, you know, within and in relation to. Um, and that's really where the Shore Friendly Program uh, I think comes into play. We've had a lot of really um, great questions in the chat today. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times our answers to questions um, like the ones we saw in the chat are, it really depends on your particular property. Um, as Andrea discussed, we have different shore types um, that are dominated by you know, different processes, whether it's, you know, waves or, um, you know, landslide conditions. And so it, it really um, often on our shorelines, it comes down to um, what is your particular property look like? And, um, and that's where the shore friendly program, I think, can really come into play, uh, because we do work directly with individual landowners um, as much as we can when you are considering your options. Um, and when you're in that decision making process, um, definitely, just like uh, Andrea was saying, whenever it's possible um, to just go the route of managing drainage and vegetation, um, that's going to be your easiest and cheapest route for mitigating erosion. Um, when we start talking about building structures and getting into those permitting conversations, um, things get, get complicated and expensive, um, but we can definitely help you um, consider, you know, what is what are the conditions on your site and, and what are your real um, needs and goals and, and whether that's the direction you choose to go, um, we can connect you with resources with the county to do that. Um, but what Shore Friendly can do in relation to bulkheads um, and uh, shoreline protection is help you to understand, you know, if you're a person who has a bulkhead that really isn't necessary, we can help you to access um, support, including funding support to get rid of those structures. 
or if you're in an area where um, an alternative to a bulkhead would be appropriate, um, we can help you consider that as well. So I do wanna just highlight quickly, I'll be very brief, um, but you know, in some areas, bulkheads were put in where they're really not needed and landowners can um, remove those structures and to you know, improve their natural beach often you know, makes it cheaper for them, kind of the maintenance costs goes away and um, you get nice, easy, accessible beaches. Of course, this really depends on what kind of shore form you're on and where your house is located. Just another bulkhead removal example here from um, Kitsap County, where you can see that bulkhead was built really low on the beach. And so by removing it, um, this landowner gained a lot of beach basically and a lot of easy access. Um, like I said, we're gonna go quickly through, the, through these. Um, but when we talk about alternatives to bulkheads, um, there are some project elements um, that can be used to provide um, some level of protection from a more kind of natural approach. Um, you know, these soft shore elements, they don't completely halt erosion, um, but sometimes they can um, help to kind of work with those natural processes that Andrea has discussed um, to kind of help either restore uh, an area that was previously armored um, or potentially to um, be a transition sometimes between armor and unarmored places um, or to just kind of fill some of those natural functions um, that things like storm berms and driftwood would normally provide. Um, I do wanna say that these kind of soft shore elements are again, really site specific and um, are, not, um, are not something that folks can necessarily do on their own. These are engineered solutions that, that do require still permitting and um, engineering to install. So we'll just go over quickly what some of those soft shore elements are. Um, so log placement is definitely a part of um, often projects where people take out armor in order to have a more natural beach. Um, sometimes they will include log placement to provide um, some uh, protective function. Um, but logs, you know, we've learned over many years and many projects, logs really need to be um, placed strategically. Again, this is an engineered solution. Um, they generally need to be above the high water line. Um, so this is something that we can help you consider um, for your property if you are in a place where that makes sense as an alternative to a hard armor approach. Uh, beach nourishment is another kind of soft shore element that's often used, especially in places where we take out prior armor. So we have a before image on top here and an after on the bottom. You can see they took out a lot of um, kind of large rock and um, were able to add sediment so gravel and sand to that beach to kind of nourish or feed that beach, help it regain some of its um, historical shape. Um, of course, as Andrea reminded us, uh, sand and gravel move around. So beach nourishment, really depending on where you are, um, can be pretty temporary, but sometimes it can help to kind of kickstart some natural processes or to feed um, a beach that has been previously starved by being armored for a period of time. And um, as Andrea also mentioned, um, re-sloping and re-establishing vegetation, you know, getting that shoreline back to um, a more stable and protected um, shape in terms of the, the vegetation protection um, can be really um, important for uh, adding some, some, a more natural approach to um, stabilization of the entire bluff face. Um, and of course, um, in some areas, uh, you know, depending on where you are, the particular geology of your bluff, um, the, you know, the way that a property was developed, sometimes um, moving a structure out of, um, you know, the, the, the risk area is going to be the best option. Um, and some studies out of North Puget Sound have shown that um, this can also actually be a cheaper option than trying to continually maintain um, something like shoreline armor. 
um, in an area that has active landslide that, you know, again, that shoreline armor is not going to stop landslides, right? Um, and so sometimes just looking at, you know, where, where the costs are, um, just having that one time move the structure cost can actually be, be cheaper in the long run and achieve that peace of mind um, for both the current owner and any inheritor or future owner of the property. So those are all kind of um, alternatives that can be considered um, instead of installing something like hard armor or in cases where we can take hard armor out and move toward a more natural shoreline that really works with these natural processes that we know happen rather than trying to work against them. Um, of course, these methods can be combined um, and they, like I said, are very site specific. And so um, often we can't really answer really general questions about these things. They really um, do require kind of an up close and personal look at your um, individual property. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I already have a bulkhead, but um, I really think I need it. And I still wanna do uh, my part to be a good steward of Puget Sound. Um, there are absolutely still things that you can do. Um, basic things like maintaining as many native plants on your property as you can, making sure that your septic system is um, always operating uh, properly so that you're not um, contributing to any water quality issues. Um, avoiding any fertilizers and chemical use on your property since you're so close to the water is important. Um, and if you are thinking about making any changes to things on your property, you know, for anything from pruning or cutting down trees to um, regrading or moving around sediments, making sure that you're consulting with the, uh, the regular regulators and getting the proper permits will be an important uh, way to, to be a good steward of your shoreline. And I know we're getting close here, so we're gonna skip a few of these slides. And I just really wanna emphasize that um, the Shore Friendly Program is here to um, provide you with um, that assistance when you are considering making decisions or changes to your property or when you are facing challenges, we do offer site visits. Um, so myself or other folks from our program can come and visit your property and really talk about what are your goals, what are your challenges, and take a look at your specific conditions. And then we can provide technical assistance in the form of written recommendations, things like planting recommendations or drainage recommendations. And then in areas where um, your goals really align with habitat benefits, we can also connect you with um, funding opportunities. So kind of in summary, um, we understand that shorelines are, are dynamic and complex places um, and, and we encourage you whenever possible to consider solutions um, that kind of work with those natural processes as much as possible, um, both for your success and for um, the preservation of our, our shared natural resources. A very quick thank you to um, all of our partners and staff. Um, thank you to our funders through Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National Estuary Program. Um, in the next couple of days, you're gonna get an email from me with um, a link to basically a folder of what would normally be the handouts at a workshop. Obviously we can't hand them to you today, so you're gonna get them in your inbox. Um, and that'll have a lot of really um, great guidance documents um, for, for sharing, um, you know, if you're with your neighbors, if you'd like, or just for, for guiding your own projects. And um, if you visit our website, that's where you can fill out the Shoreline site visit request form. Um, I know we are still working through um, sort of a, a backlog, a list of folks. We've had lots of interest, so we're really excited, um, but we are working our way through that list. Um, so you feel free to to add yourself um, via the request form.